Yes. Um, good morning, sir. I'm going to pick up um, matters with the Royal Liverpool Hospital, the Liverpool Haemophilia Centre, um, and look at the topic of n knowledge of risk um, and any response to risk or evidence of response to risk. In terms of hepatitis, uh, the UK HCDO minutes show that Dr Black was a regular attender on behalf of the Liverpool Centre at meetings in 1971, 74 and 75. But hepatitis risks were discussed at those meetings. Dr Bolton was a regular attender of UK HCDO meetings during his time at Liverpool in 1975 to 1980. And Dr McVerry, a regular attender um, at UK HCDO meetings during his period as director, 80 to 85. Dr. Mackey, who appears to have taken on the de facto role of director in that interregnum period between Dr. McVerry leaving and, and Dr. Hay starting, um, attended some UK HCDO meetings, 85, 86. Um, and then Professor Hay was a regular attender um, in his capacity as director at Liverpool from 1987. And so it may reasonably be assumed uh, that um, they would have been aware of the discussions taking place at those minutes uh, uh, and um, would presumably have received uh, uh, those meetings and would presumably have received copies of the minutes um, that were circulated subsequent to the meetings. Um, there are just a handful then of additional documents in relation to hepatitis to refer to. Um, if we start with DHSC 01-03394 underscore 095, please, Shomik. Um, this is not directly concerned with... Um, uh, post-transfusion hepatitis, um, but it's notes of the Symposium of, on Hepatitis um, held by the Association for the Study of Infectious Disease in December 1970. And if we go to page five, sorry, bottom of page four, and we go to the bottom of the page, we can see there there's a heading Hepatitis in Dialysis Units, uh, and there is a presentation by a Dr. Finn from Liverpool, hemodialysis-associated hepatitis in Liverpool. A total of 57 cases were reported during the period 1960 to 70. 16 patients, 13 staff and 8 relatives were involved. No deaths had occurred. The blood of infected renal... Let me just go to the top of the next page. Failure patients tended to remain highly infective over long periods. One patient remained antigen positive four years after being infected. Seven antigen positive patients remained on home dialysis and were excluded from the unit being treated in isolation if they had to return to hospital. In the speaker's view, it was unethical to expose young nursing staff to a known risk of infection. And if preventive measures could not reduce this risk to an acceptable level, there was a case for reducing the extent to which dialysis should be carried out. He advocated screening of new patients, reduction of transfusion to a minimum and using, using only biologically safe blood, i.e. from a donor whose blood had been used on at least five occasions without causing complications, as well as being antigen tested before use. Reduction in the size of dialysis units, a strict code of practice designed to protect staff. It was thought that the virus could be non-toxic, liver damage being caused by antigen antibody reaction, it seemed logical, therefore, to give steroids early in the treatment of the disease. So an early um, insight from a different perspective, uh, um, but in Liverpool in relation to hepatitis um, in dialysis. Um, returning then to uh, um, direct evidence... That, that, of, um, that must have been hepatitis B, given yes. the reference to antigen and testing. Yes, it must have been, yes, and given the date, which is 1970. Um, t turning um, then to um, materials relevant to bleeding disorder patients directly, uh, if we go to HCDO 30s, 1093, please, Shomek. Um, we've got the annual return for 1976 here, but if we go to the third page... And um, we can see a letter from Dr. Bolton to Miss Spooner at Oxford, 23rd of September 1977, um, sending the annual returns. There's a reference in the first paragraph um, to saying, 
well, Dr. Morgan says this, all I can say is that the final compilation has not been quite so easy as some of our medical records have the annoying habit of going missing just when they are wanted. Um, and then he says, this is the best I can offer you at this stage. As you'll remember from a telephone call for some months ago, I feel that I'm not able to take part in Dr. Kirk's jaundice survey. And this is a bit regrettable as two of our patients have had some form of hepatitis during 1976 at 77. Um, and then uh, he amplifies on the, the two cases. Um, in relation to the first, um, it, it, it appears that the hepatitis is attributed to batches or a batch of cryobulin. Um, uh, uh, and um, bottom of the page, Dr. Bolton says this, uh, um, the, Mr. X had the misfortune to contract a very mild form of hepatitis while I was out of the country at the end of last year. And the fact that he contracted jaundice did not come to my attention until I eventually located his notes about a month ago. I can only apologize for the extremely bad light in which this has put the whole system at the Royal Infirmary. And then over the page, uh, he refers to a second patient contracting jaundice. Uh, it would seem as a result um, of uh, treatment with cryoprecipitate and Dr. Bolton says all the units of cryo which were involved have been identified and the transfusion centre notified. Um, so there is um, an example of information about patients infected with hepatitis uh, being provided to Oxford um, and, and there are um, there's another letter the following uh, I think no, two years later 1979 from um, Dr. Bolton saying that there hadn't been any further cases in, in 78 or 79 of hepatitis or jaundice. Um, in terms of Dr. Bolton's own understanding of hepatitis risks, um, in the statement he's provided so far to the inquiry, he has said this um, in relation to the period um, uh, as at 1980. He says, I was aware, as any of my colleagues responsible for the care of people with bleeding disorders such as haemophilia... Uh, as aware, is it? Yeah, as aware, yes, sorry. Because um, it al that alters the sense a little. It does, yes. Um, that transfusion of human-derived blood products carries a risk of transmitting viral hepatitis to any recipient, although in early 1980 the degree of that risk was uncertain. Um, he says also it was suspected that blood products obtained commercially carried a greater risk than products produced by the NHS laboratories, which in turn carried a greater risk of transmission by cryoprecipitate from regional transfusion centres such as Liverpool. Um, Dr. Bolton obviously gave evidence to the Penrose inquiry, and although the focus of much of that evidence um, was his later period um, in the blood services in Scotland, um, he was asked uh, about um, his knowledge of hepatitis in the 1970s. And if we go to PRSE 306024... Um, we've got the transcript of his oral evidence to the Penrose inquiry. Um, if we go to page um, eight, Shamik, he was asked if he recalls seeing the World in Action documentary. Um, and at line six, he says, I didn't see the programmes live, but I was very shortly made aware of those programmes. And then he refers to having a brother on the working with Granada on the World in Action team at the time and, and saying that he, um, rem he remembered being slightly cross with him because at that time, and in fact on reflection I think my brother was right, I felt that the World in Action programme had exaggerated the problems, um, but then I was quite a young and not very experienced doctor and not quite so aware of how things would work out. Um, uh, but he says then, uh, in relation to the World in Action programme, this is line 19, I certainly remember it very well and I remember conversations after it. Um, he says he wasn't actually yet in Liverpool at the time the programme came out. Um, he was in the middle of moving. Um, and then if we go to the next page, bottom half of um, the page, he then sets out his recollection of uh, uh, hepatitis in a patient. Um, this was when he was working in London, um, in, in Christmas Eve 1973. Uh, he says... Um, I ordered in, this is line 23, bottom of the page, a small amount of commercial factor eight, which was just becoming available at that time. And this mild haemophilic man in his 50s did receive 
some commercial factor eight as a result of which he got both hepatitis B and non-A, non-B. So that struck home to me very vividly. So this is before he's moved to Liverpool. So I had a rather rude awakening into the dangers of hepatitis from commercial. In this case, it was American factor eight. So one of the naive reactions that I had in Liverpool was when we bought commercial factor eight, it was not American, it was European. It came from Austria. So clearly there had been a concern that American products were to be avoided. I think that was a legitimate or at least an understandable reaction to my experience of treating and giving a patient. And um, we didn't know at that time exactly the consequences of non-A, non-B. Um, it's very likely if that man's still alive, and I remember him well, he would be in his mid-80s now, it's quite likely that he would have had quite a significant dose of hepatitis and liver disease. And then he sets out his understanding. Well, the, the next question... Is where did Immuno get their plasma? His understanding, Austria. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, it goes on, the exchange. Yes. So um, he says, um, it was Austrian plasma, yes. The question is, they didn't import. And he says, quite honestly, I did not at that time conduct a detailed inquiry into where all the donors came from. Top of the next page. And it is, it is indeed quite possible that some of the plasma they procured and fractionated came from America. I would not know that, but at the time, I was clearly under the impression and had been told by their own director, Norman Berry, that the material was Austrian in origin, but clearly from paid donors. Um, so that's uh, um, Dr. Bolton's um, uh, evidence, or part of Dr. Bolton's evidence to the Penrose inquiry. Um, I'm not going to go through the, the, what was discussed at the UKHCDO meetings that he attended, but the presentations from Dr. Krask, the reports of the work of the Hepatitis Working Party and so on, which we've looked at in earlier hearings, um, came up on a regular basis in the second half of the 1970s when Dr. Bolton uh, was attending these meetings as the um, consultant from Liverpool. In, in terms of Dr. McVeary's understanding of the risks of hepatitis, um, his um, statement uh, says that he, he did not, in the late 70s and early 80s, realise that non-A, non-B hepatitis could be serious. He was asked about whether patients were informed about the risks of non-A, non-B hepatitis, and he says non-A, non-B was something that we did not understand, um, and, and then his statement's not entirely clear as to what he then means. He says it was something where I did not think that here was a risk from factor concentrates in relation to non-A, non-B hepatitis. He sets out a general recollection that it was an unknown entity and thought to be of minor significance, and then says this, whilst I can no longer recall what was said, it may have been that I would have avoided causing potential anxiety and so not informed them, by which he means patients, about a condition that I thought was benign. Um, so that's um, some of the evidence we have in relation to Dr. Bolton's and uh, Dr. McVary's knowledge of hepatitis. Um, in that period, 1975 to 1985. I'm not going to repeat anything about Professor Hayes' evidence, um, which we, we heard orally last year, uh, and he came on the scene in terms of Liverpool a little later in, 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 in mid-1987. In terms of risk of, of AIDS, HGLV3, Dr. McVery in his statement says that he had no awareness of AIDS before he attended the UK HCDO meeting at which it was first discussed, which was September of 1982. Um, he refers to um, Professor Bloom having said, even up to mid-1984, that there was no proven association between HIV and the use of blood products. He says it was reasonably clear that there was a real risk that AIDS was transmitted through blood and blood products at the end of 83 or beginning of 1984, but difficult to say with any certainty. Um, he believes he would have read that January 1983 article by Dr. Deforge in the New England Journal on AIDS because he had worked with her in the States, in Boston. Uh, he says that the Royal Liverpool didn't change its processes in response to the June 83 letter from Professor Bloom and Dr. Ritzer with recommendations, but says it broadly followed um, the, the position set out in that letter. He's not sure what would have been said and when to patients about the risk of being infected with AIDS from factor concentrates due to uncertainties around the issue. Uh, he doesn't recall any reversion to cryoprecipitate 
as a response to the risk of AIDS. Um, he says patients didn't like cryo. There were practical concerns with its use, um, but he doesn't uh, set out any positive contemplation of a return to cryoprecipitate or increased use of cryoprecipitate as a, a response to the risk of AIDS. Um, and, and then he has a recollection of a move to heat-treated factor VIII in 1985. And um, one um, other document, although it doesn't involve Dr. McVeary himself, um, but, but again, it, it does involve commissions in, um, from Liverpool, uh, is RLIT 40567. This is a, a letter published in The Lancet, 16th of April, 1983. If we go to the bottom of the page, we can see there's a letter headed, Kaposi's sarcoma um, in patient with multiple myeloma, uh, sideroblastic anemia, and T lymphocyte abnormalities. Um, if we go over to the second page, please, Shamik, we can see top left-hand who this is from. So it includes Dr. Bellingham, um, and it's from the Departments of Hematology, Immunology, and Dermatology, University of Liverpool, and Royal Liverpool Hospital. Um, and then if we go back to the first page and look at the bottom right-hand corner, it, it, it's describing a particular patient n n n not concerned with um, uh, uh, treatment with, with, with someone with bleeding disorders, but a particular patient um, presenting with uh, well, possible Kaposi's sarcoma. And the last eight or so lines on the right-hand side say this, as yet we have no evidence of generalised Kaposi's sarcoma in this patient, etc. And then it says this, he has received multiple blood transfusions, also thought to be associated with the development of AIDS. So that would suggest... And he gives a reference for that. He does. The reference is, if we go to the second page... Yeah, it's a foot, foot of the page. Oh, it is. Sorry, no, bottom of the first page. Uh, it, his reference is the MMWR from 1982. That's probably the July edition, is it, or not? Um, I can't say without checking whether it's the July or possibly the December 82 edition. It doesn't give a date, but we can check. It gives a reference, and we can check which, which edition he's referring to. But certainly this is as at April 83, clinicians in the Department of Hematology... Uh, um, um, in um, the uh, Royal Liverpool Hospital, recognising that the receipt of multiple blood transfusions was thought to be associated with the development of AIDS. Yes. Um, we, we can take that down, thank you. Um, one issue which is of particular significance in relation to the Liverpool Centre um, is the question of the arrangements for testing patients for HTLV3 and informing them of their diagnosis. And, and you may recall Professor Hay giving evidence that when he arrived in 1987 in, in Liverpool, uh, he had a number of concerns about the way in which testing and communication of diagnosis had been undertaken. Um, so if we start with... Um, a publication, um, a, another publication in the Lancet, this one um, co-authored by Dr. McVeary. Uh, it is PRSE 301758. This is February 1985, 9th of February 1985, the Lancet, um, and the uh, letter is the letter on the top half of the page, left-hand side, Zero conversion for HTLV3 since 1980 in British haemophiliacs. Um, it, it's authored by Dr. Machin um, um, uh, and Dr. McVeary, amongst others, uh, and says this three UK cases of acquired immunodeficiency syndrome in haemophilic patients and several reports of a pre AIDS like syndrome have been recorded. And then there's a reference to a, 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 a number of studies, including one at, at least of which that we've looked at. Um, and then we can see in the next paragraph, it refers to studies to determine the source of infection. We've been able to test sera from a cohort of 20 severe haemophiliacs with factor VIII at sea levels uh, um, below a certain uh, level. Sera were collected in 1980 to 81, in September 1982, 
and again in September 1984, all these patients had received regular prophylactic home therapy with factor VIII concentrate with an average annual treatment rate of 29,000 units. Between 1982 and 1984, 60%, nine out of 15 of these hemophiliacs zero converted for HGLV3 antibody. Only one was seropositive in 80 to 81. Five had antibody in 82, 14 were seropositive in 1984. These patients had received both NHS and commercial non-heat treated factor VIII concentrates and had had 44 to 80% of their treatment requirements as commercial product. And if we look at the last paragraph, these results confirm the increasing seropositivity of British haemophiliacs exposed to regular infusions of factor VIII concentrate over the past four years. We do not know what proportion of seropositive patients will acquire AIDS or other HGLV3-related disease. All 16 who were seropositive are well, including the six who were seropositive in 1982. Only one has thrombocytopenia and lymphopenia. Now, this clearly involved um, Liverpool patients. One of the striking things about this is the date. This is talking. This is a publication in February 1985. Um, so some testing, some HTLV3 testing in relation to Liverpool patients had presumably been undertaken in order for this study to be published. But the records that we've looked at and some of the witness evidence that we've received appears to show testing at Liverpool um, being undertaken rather later than this. So we've looked at sample medical records which indicate that it's after Dr. McVary leaves and when Dr. Mackey and to some extent of Dr. Davis are dealing with the care of patients with haemophilia, we see HGLV3 tests being undertaken roughly from mid-1985 onwards. Um, and, and the evidence we have of the communication of the outcome of HGLV3 tests, again, places it rather more in the second half of 85 and into 86 territory. Um, so it, it does raise the question as to why, if, um, as at early 1985, Dr. McVery was aware of this, as he must have been, given his co-authorship of this letter and his involvement in this study, more urgent steps were not being apparently taken to test all the patients in Liverpool and to inform them uh, appropriately uh, of the results of those tests. Well, uh, in, in this... Uh this letter is co-authored by uh, Chang Sung Popov. It is. Uh, and it, it was uh, her study reported in The Lancet in, I think, September 84. Uh, of uh, 1984, which reported uh, on a series of tests conducted, presumably Middlesex, I think it was, by, by TEDA, um, and showed that uh, at least a third were positive. Um, in fact, uh, yes, to, uh, th that's at Middlesex. So somewhere, um, the, the cohort that they were talking about had been assembled um, and may have involved McVeary's patients from somewhere. It, it, it would certainly seem um, um, odd for Dr. McVeary to be in, involved in, in, in the, the co-authorship of this if it didn't involve Liverpool patients having been at Liverpool since 1980. I mean, it, it's, it would be wrong to conclude from this that there were Liverpool patients necessarily involved in this study, wouldn't uh, it? it it's, it's a matter of inference or, or possibility. It may have been the case. Yes. Um, but the point that you're, you're raising this with me for is to show uh, that McVeary had a, a working knowledge, at any rate, uh, of uh, the, re the likelihood of, of positive testing if it were undertaken, um, and uh, the, uh, the second last sentence stands out to me. Um, we don't know what proportion of seropositive patients will acquire AIDS or other HTLV3 related disease, which would make it impossible for anyone uh, reading this or taking that view with that information to say to a patient, oh, don't worry, because not, not very many people go on to, to get this disease. They're, they're all well, and the likelihood is they'll all stay well. Yes. Because we may hear evidence to that effect said somewhere else 
later on today. We may. Uh, and obviously, wherever precisely this cohort of patients was drawn from, um, uh, there were clearly there had been samples of sera taken over previous years and stored. Yes. Uh, and for some reason, starting in 1980. Yes. Um, uh, if we go to a later study, um, which is at RLIT 40127, you'll see this is a publication in the British Journal of Haematology in 1986. Um, and it's um, Dr. McVeary is the, the, the first named author um, on, on this occasion. Uh, again, we see Dr. Machin, Chain Singh Popov, Dr. Tedder, um, who were all um, uh, named on the earlier letter, and then a range of others. Um, and we can see it was received June 1985, accepted for publication October 1985. Uh, um, it, the summary records 44% of 63 British patients were either haemophilia A or with, with either haemophilia A or B were HGLB3 antibody positive. HGLB3 was more frequent in high factor 8 concentrate users and 75% of severely affected haemophilia A patients were HGLB3. Now we know that this did include a cohort of Liverpool patients because we can see that set out on the second page under the heading patients and methods second paragraph a cohort of 21 Liverpool haemophiliacs 19 haemophilia A 2 haemophilia B all but 2 haemophilia A patients were severely affected was studied retrospectively since 1980-81 for HDLB3 antibody and in 1984 for T48 subset ratios um, uh, it also refers to investigation of the wives of 14 HGLB3 positive patients being investigated. Um, and if we look at the bottom of the next page, we see again reference to a cohort of haemophiliacs attending the Royal Liverpool Hospital Haemophilia Centre. Um, and we, we have there the zero conversion, or what's suggested to be rough zero conversion dates or dates when patients were found to be positive, um, um, 1980, 81, 82, um, and 84. Um, so that would, um, it, it may increase the likelihood that the earlier letter did involve a Liverpool co cohort, but on any view, this, which must have been work completed by June of 1985, reveals HGLB3 testing and retrospective testing on a cohort of Liverpool patients and their partners. Yet still, the, there doesn't appear to have been a programme of testing of all of the Liverpool patients until after this time. Yes, and the, the likelihood, given what is said here, is that this is the same, same cohort. The numbers broadly correspond. Yes or that the first was a subset of this cohort. Yes. It, it, do, it does, and given the date ranges that are being examined, it does seem likely. Um, Dr. McVeary, um, uh, in his statement, um, couldn't recall stored sera being tested before 1984. He doesn't recall the process for testing patients for HGLB3. He doesn't recall testing in Liverpool outside the Machin study, so he has except there was testing in relation to the Machin study. He can't recall what discussions took place with patients. Um, he can't say whether patients knew that samples of their sera were, be, were being stored or understood the purpose of storage. Uh, he does say that the hospital or the centre would have obtained verbal permission to obtain the original samples for tests performed at the time the test was taken. So that's um, um, the evidence we have in summary form from Dr. McVeary. You'll recall Professor Hay telling the inquiry that when he arrived at the Liverpool Centre, um, he found the records to be poor and uninformative. He was unable to obtain the results of HGLB3 tests, which had apparently been carried out. He says he made inquiries with Dr. McVeary about apparent testing on stored samples, but didn't get an answer to that, uh, his correspondence. Dr. McVeary says he can't recall receiving such correspondence from Professor Hay. 
Professor Hay also told the inquiry he, he, he was told by Liverpool patients they'd been told they were HDLB3 positive by post. Um, Dr. McVeary can't recall what the arrangements were, but says the, he, he would have expected it to be uh, um, asking the patient to make an appointment and telling them in person. Um, before we look at um, some of the material on that particular topic that the inquiry has received from, from patients at the Liverpool Centre, if we could look back at Professor Hayes' um, HIV litigation document, it's at NHBT 0085908. Thank you. Mr. Book has tested, and the MMWR referred to um, in that footnote was the December 82 MMWR. December. December. Thank you. Um, if we go to. So that, that, that's the San Francisco baby. Yes, exactly. And, and the other cases of transfusion, um, transmitted infection. Um, if we go to page 18, please. So th this was, we assume, Professor Hayes' understanding, in, uh, as at the time this document was being prepared, so probably around 1989 or so, um, about the position in Liverpool. If we pick it up where it says paragraph 92BH, um, it says, both in Liverpool and in Sheffield, samples were sent to Dr. Tedder Middlesex Hospital for HIV testing in early 1985. This was very incomplete in Liverpool, and Dr. McVeary has left no record of his results, even though he published them. Many Liverpool patients were not tested until late 1985, early 1986. And that, Dr. Professor Hayes' recollection there is consistent with what we've seen from individual patient records. Um, he goes on to say some of the patients were informed of their HIV status by post. Parents of children were informed by Alderhey in a similar way, and we'll be looking at Alderhey later this morning. Not all patients were informed with results until later in 1986. Um, and then, um, uh, b bottom of the page, he says, I was not in post and cannot tell you, neither can the notes what pretest counselling patients had the counselling and, in most cases, the first test result is not documented. Most patients were not adequately counselled until Dr. Mackey took over the centre in 1986. Most untested individuals were summoned by Dr. Mackey in 1986 and most seen with their spouses. He counselled them and generally documented the counselling. This took place in his room or in an OPD. Um, uh, um, yes, so I think that's all we probably need to look at from Professor. Well, the, the, the bottom of the page. There. Yes, very bottom. Parents and guardians were the responsibility of Dr. John Martin Alderhay, uh, about whom we'll be hearing more. Um, so, in, in, in terms then of the witness evidence that the inquiry um, has received, and this is really just to give a flavour of it, it's not intended to be an exhaustive summary. The widow of a haemophilia B patient infected with HIV following treatment with factor IX has described her husband attending the centre and himself asking for a test. Uh, he had the test and she says, we received a letter in the post in the summer of 1985 stating that he was positive. I remember the letter. Her husband read it to her and passed it to her. She recalls it was a short letter of no more than two or three sentences. Uh, she says, you might think unsurprisingly, her husband should have been told in person and we weren't given any information to help us to understand or manage the infection. Um, the widow of a haemophilia A patient describes that her husband being told during a routine appointment that a stored sample of blood had tested positive for HIV despite the patient not knowing that his blood would be stored or tested, uh, and says we were told by the doctor not to worry about anything, the hospital would look after us. The widow of another haemophilia A patient describes, ag again, her husband receiving um, the information that he had HIV during a routine appointment. Uh, her account is this, perhaps worth just reading out. This consultant was flicking through my husband's medical records and came to a page which, which was marked with the words HIV, the consultant just said the words HIV in a very matter-of-fact way and then continued to flick through the notes. My husband stopped and said, HIV, what is that? 
I did not know anything about that. The consultant basically said words to the effect of, yes, you have this. Um, another patient gives an account of being told um, in person that they were positive. The evidence about that patient suggests that that was later, that was 1987, might, might it possibly have been being told by, by Dr. Hay. Um, and then I think it may be worth actually looking at um, a further account, which is um, at... Um, and I should say we, we, we don't yet have, um, uh, in relation to a number of these accounts, we don't have responses yet from Dr. McVeary. S some of these do not necessarily involve Dr. McVeary. They are talking about the later stage of HIV testing, which took place after he'd left, because not all patients had been tested while he was still there. Some of the accounts do involve Dr. McVeary. The one I'm going to refer to next does. We, we haven't yet had a response from him, not, I think, through any fault of his own. So it, it may be he would have a different account to give. But if we go to WITN 1403001, please. Um, this is a statement from a widow who... who um, it, it, describes her husband's care at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. Um, if we go to the second page, um, uh, we can pick it up, um, uh, paragraph nine. Um, she says, he was not, to my knowledge, given any information relating to the risks associated with the use of factor eight or any associated risks of infection, neither was I. Whilst I've no specific dates or treatment batch information relating to his infection with HIV, it's clear he first displayed clear indications of a suppressed immune system and a rapid decline in his health from 1984 onwards. Um, it refers to him undergoing surgery at the Royal Liverpool in 1984, after which his health started to deteriorate rapidly. They were told he had contracted a virus they suspected to be salmonella. She was made to wear protective clothing when visiting him. Um, next page. Um, and, and I should just say, it, it is not clear whether the dates can be right because, or entirely right because they refer to Dr. McVeary and Dr. McVeary had left by this time. So either it's a different doctor or the dates may, may, may not be entirely right. Um, but, but whatever it is, the thrust of the account is, is a fairly um, remarkable one. The first discussion that we had with a doctor regarding the possibility of HIV infection was with a junior doctor at the Liverpool Royal Hospital in October 1985. This was long after I suspected he'd been infected. I'd repeatedly asked medical professionals to test and offer him some form of targeted treatment. The junior doctor confirmed he believed her husband was suffering with AIDS. This was never confirmed by Dr. McVeary, who was the consultant overseeing his care at the time. Dr. McVeary simply dismissed my concerns. Um, I, was, I had blood taken twice to be tested. I was never informed this was due to any risk of HIV, but was told this was to test for salmonella. I recall asking why our daughters were not being tested as we all ate the same food at home, but I was reassured this wasn't necessary as it was me who was in closest contact with him. If we go down the page. The only information I was getting was from the media coverage. I read about symptoms of HIV AIDS in the news. I thought they were very similar to the symptoms he was suffering from. When I raised my concerns with Dr. McVeary that he was suffering from the symptoms of AIDS, he advised me that my husband's symptoms could be explained by numerous viruses or infections. He denied it was AIDS and he told me not to be neurotic. In one such meeting with Dr. McVeary, when I was frantically explaining how concerned I was for my husband's health, he was swinging around in a swivel chair whilst eating a Kit Kat. This shows the kind of treatment I received from Dr. McVeary. Without confirmation of infection from the staff treating my husband, I sought desperate measures for a firm diagnosis and treatment options. Uh, and, and she then describes, in October 1985, traveling to St. Mary's Hospital in an attempt to speak to Professor Hinching. Um, he was unavailable, she says, but staff at the hospital facilitated a telephone conversation during which Professor Pinching agreed that her husband's symptoms uh, and history were likely to be associated with HIV, and he agreed he would discuss her husband's case with Dr. McVeary. Um, and then if we look at paragraph 21, after my consultation with Professor Pinching, Dr. McVeary told me not to question his standing or undermine his opinions as he was my husband's treating consultant. The clear implication was that he uh, knew best. 
Uh, and then she refers in paragraph 23 to her husband's record showing his sample bags sent for testing were labelled as high risk. And we do have some documents, not, I think, relating to this individual patient, but we've got some documents we've looked at from Liverpool which have that high-risk label. They also show he was first tested for HTLV3 in January 1985. There were also tests sent in June 1985 to the Hospital for Tropical Diseases in London where he was tested for neurocystitis. Neither of us was warned that he may be suffering from HIV or any potentially infectious disease. Um, and uh, her husband died, as you will see, not, not long after that. Now, leaving aside the issue about dates and the fact that we know Dr. McBerry had left sometime in the course of 1985. I don't think we know the precise date, however. Um, the account that's given there um, is not inconsistent with her husband having been one of that cohort of patients. Uh, what, one thing which uh, I, I just want to be clear about this witness statement, does it identify her husband as having suffered uh, hemophilia? Or was there some other reason that he had the surgery? A severe haemophilia A. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't go to that passage, but yes. And received most of his care from the Royal Liverpool Hospital. Um, received intensive factor eight concentrates in the first half of the 1980s. Um, and I um, should just say... Look at um, there's a document at HSOC zero zero one one two four five. Um, th this is a letter sent from the same widow. Um, um, looks as though it was sent to the Haemophilia Society. It's a Haemophilia Society originated document in any event. We don't have a date for it, but you will see she gives essentially the same or very similar account to the, um, the account that, that is set out in the witness statement that she has kindly provided to the inquiry. Um, and refers to the, the, the fact that she was tested. Um, um, and if we go towards the bottom of the page, we, we see um, it, it refers to her um, sp um, speaking to, to Dr. Pinching. So as I say, I, I, we don't think have a date for that, but, but it is. Um, uh, um, a clearly a, a, an account given, an, an earlier account given uh, of the same um, sequence of events. Um, if we, just to, again to give an indication um, about dates of, of, of testing more generally in, in Liverpool, if we go to... Actually, no, I'm going to come to that later. There's a handful of, 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 uh, there's a handful of documents and medical records, sample medical records that we've looked at, which, which confirm a testing process being undertaken for, uh, for other patients, as I say, in the second half of 1985 um, or later. Um, and then in, in terms of the communication of results um, in the period after Dr. McBerry had left, if we look at... A moment when I get the reference. WITN 3381002. Oh, sorry, actually, can we not put that up? Because I just want to. I'm going to read out the letter. I'm not sure whether the name um, should have been redacted and hasn't been. And I have an identical letter with a redacted, in redacted form. If we put up this version, 
actually um, it, yeah, it's the same letter, but in the, with the, the full reductions. LBHT six zeros one underscore zero zero nine. So we can see it's a letter from the updated the 1st of July 1986. Um, it's from Dr. Davis, consultant haematologist. Um, so again, it's in this interregnum period after M M Dr. McVeary leaves and before P Dr. Hay takes over. We now have your final HTLB3 results from Manchester, and unfortunately, they are positive. They do add the rider that we should repeat this test when next we see you but I think you should now assume that you are HTLB3 positive, or HTLB positive, and take the precautions which we discussed the last time we met. I am sorry this is not good news. If you do want to discuss this further, then of course I will see you in the department any time. Now, it, it's a letter that suggests that there had been some prior discussion that the testing was, testing was going to be undertaken, but you'll see it, the communication of the result is undertaken by post in this short fashion. Um, and not in person. Um, uh, and, and there are um, uh, uh, others who, um, uh, uh, as we've seen, have described being informed of their uh, um, results by letter. Um, and that was clearly Dr. Hayes' understanding, Professor Hayes' understanding when he took over. Um, there's another witness um, who recalls being um, um, phoned at work. Um, uh, uh, although, in their case, the result was um, was um, negative, um, and and but that that witness also describes a period of testing that that it goes on through 1986. So again, it, it, it suggests that the the process of testing all patients or, or all patients who were um, might have been infected at the Liverpool Hospital was taking place really over a rather prolonged period of time and much later. Than, than you might think it should have been. If we go to HSOC 0015592, please. And we go to the second page. just zoom in on the heading wife infected in test delay um, a haemophiliac who was found in hospital tests to be infected with the AIDS virus was not told of the result for several months he has now passed on the infection to his wife the couple who come from Merseyside and have a young daughter are furious that the wife's life was put needlessly at risk their solicitor said that the husband, who is 30, had received treatment with factor VIII blood concentrate through the Royal Liverpool Hospital. She said, we don't know um, who um, that relates to, um, but, but you'll see it being documented there. Um, there's then another account from a patient um, at... I'm just going to, I think, read um, a handful of the relevant passages. Um, so th this is a patient um, uh, who uh, um, is deaf, um, treated uh, with severe haemophilia A, treated at, um, both at Alder Hay um, as a child, um, and then... Uh, um, um, would then in the first half of the 1980s see Dr. McVeary at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. Um, so could we go to page 12 of WITN 0375001? And we pick it up at the bottom of the page in 1980. When I was 20, I used to see Dr. McBerry at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. Every six months, Dr. McBerry, my foster father, and I would be in a consultation. Dr. McBerry would talk to my foster father, who would ask me to leave the room. 
A nurse would take me by the hand and place me in another room. I was always sent out. I wanted to stay. It seemed to me that Dr. McVeary told my foster father that I had to leave. He kept the nature of my illness between him and my foster father. After these appointments, I spoke to my father in the hospital cafe. I asked him what he was talking to Dr. McVeary about when I was not in the room. He would not say. He always said it was about my leg and about my foot. He would not tell me any detail, although I would always ask him. Then in paragraph 54, um, in 1985, my dad went into hospital so he could no longer attend my appointments. And then he refers going to appointments with his foster sister. Dr. McVeary would talk to whichever foster sister attended with me, but not for long. I would have blood tests and go home. They would never tell me what Dr. McVeary said. Um, uh, and then uh, he describes um, bottom of that page how he only learnt he had HIV in October of 1991. So um, a number of years after when um, uh, he was told um, by uh, Dr. Hay. Um, and he account, recounts Dr. Hay having looked through the medical records and found out that, that the witness's foster family knew he had HIV uh, and the records indicating that Dr. Mer McVeary had told the foster father that, um, that the patient himself, although an adult, had not been told. And this is, uh, uh, at the time he describes it, the conversations taking place, he says he was 20. Yes, he was an adult. So there are two concerning aspects, if, if one accepts the account. Uh, the first is that an adult was not told. Um, and secondly, that he, he plainly, uh, according to his account, uh, questioned his foster father several times, but never spoke, never asked McVeary. So presumably, he felt that he, he couldn't or shouldn't uh, ask the person who would give him the information. Yes, I, 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 it, it's part of a much longer statement, sir, which um, merits reading in full. Um, um, but it, it, it does appear to show a, a very concerning delay in this young man as he then was being informed of But it's, it's not simply the, the, the delay, it's the quality of the communication which yes. he expected from the medical profession uh, as he um, ha had experienced it. Yes. Um, in, we can take that down, thank you, Shemek. In terms of the numbers of patients infected, um, Dr. Hayes' um, information uh, as provided to the inquiry um, was 43 patients at the Royal Liverpool Hospital infected with HIV of whom four were under the age of 18. The evidence we have suggests that the transfer from Alder Hay to the Royal Liverpool took place at around 16. Um, the table that we've more recently received from you, well, sorry, the table that the inquiry team has put together based upon um, data received from UK CDO gives a figure for the Royal Infirmary of 42. Whether it's 42 or 43, um, it's clearly a, a, a significant number of patients infected um, with HIV. Um, just in terms of, of then of the process of testing for hepatitis C, um, if we consider first the, the undertaking of liver function tests prior to the availability of a hepatitis C test, Dr. McVeary couldn't recall how regularly liver function tests were performed, but he knew they did. He says if a patient came in for a review, then a liver function test would be done uh, as one of a range of tests that were carried out um, at the patient review. He can't recall what was said um, to patients about the results. Says we were unsure what caused these abnormal results. Um, there are just a couple of letters that I think it, it's in instructive to look at in that regard. Um, Shame it, can we look at... LBHT six zeros one underscore zero zero five, please. And um, this is a letter from Dr. McVeary, seventeenth of January, nineteen eighty three, to a GP about a particular patient. As you know, um, 
the patient had an episode of acute hepatitis, which most likely was related to his factor infusions. It says he's now completely recovered. His liver function tests are essentially normal. Um, if we then look at the same reference, Shomek, but 006. It's just interesting to note that the letter from Dr. McVeary to the patient on the same date uses the term inflammation on your liver, doesn't use the term hepatitis. Um, if we um, then, uh, in relation to the process for testing um, for hepatitis C, once a hepatitis C test became available, Professor Hay addressed that in his oral evidence and his written evidence, so I won't go back over that, um, other than to um, remind you, sir, although I know you're well aware of this, that there are a number of patient accounts at Liverpool, as at elsewhere, of there being delays between patients being tested for hepatitis C and being informed of the outcome of those test results. Um, uh, we've referred in our written notes to a, a number of um, accounts in, in that regard. If I then come to the question of the treatment arrangements, first of all for, hepatitis, for HIV, Dr. McVeary recalls little about treatment for HIV positive patients, um, but there are um, some accounts from individual witnesses which paint a um, distressing picture of, of HIV care um, at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. Uh, if we look at sorry, will I just check the result, the reference there? Um, WITN two seven eight three zero zero one. Um, this is uh, a statement um, from the widow of a patient uh, with haemophilia A. Um, and if we go to page four, again, it may of course be the case that Dr. McVeary would say that this was not him or, 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 or give a different account. Um, uh, and, and so it's important to bear that in mind. But bottom of the page, she says, I recall that my husband and I attended a couple of group meetings at the Royal Liverpool University Hospital in the 1980s. This was some sort of help group. And I recall that one of the doctors there, Dr. McVeary, made the most derogatory comment to those attending to seek some so-called support. But my husband never went back. The words used by Dr. McVeary were, homo, hemo, you can all start wearing handbags now. This comment was so horrific and sufficiently so for me to recall the doctor's name after all this time. My husband was never offered any individual counselling or psychological support, she says. Uh, and then, uh, if we um, look at... WITN 1147001. Um, th this is a statement um, d uh, from a witness describing his son's uh, in infection with HIV and hepatitis C. Um, and if we just pick this up at page 7... Paragraph 31, the witness says that his son had numerous hospital admissions in the Royal Liverpool Hospital where he was treated very badly and received extremely poor standards of care. It was horrendous. It was as if the nurses had nothing but contempt for the patients. It was necessary for me to visit him every day to ensure he was eating properly, he was washed properly, and that he was receiving and taking his medication. There were many times his medication was strewn all over the floor, and I would have to make arrangements to get it replaced. I would shower him when he was too weak to do it for himself and change his bed sheets after he had soiled himself and was lying in the dirt for hours at a time. Um, we, we 
don't, I think, know, sir, what particular point in time um, that or, or, or periods of time that description uh, refers to. Um, um, the statement that we looked at um, a, a, a little earlier um, with the from the widow who spoke to, to, to Professor Pinching in order to try and find information about her husband's possible diagnosis um, also describes um, uh, poor treatment at the Royal Liverpool Hospital and this would have been in, in 1985 given um, when he became ill and died so if we just go back to WITN 1403001 And we go to page five. Paragraph 27. She recalls um, her husband um, was treated terribly whilst he was in the Royal Liverpool Hospital receiving treatment. It was largely left to me to change his clothing and bedding as the nurses appeared to not want to go in his room. On occasions when I was not present, food and drink were left on a trolley outside of his room and he was left unchanged, lying in a dirty bed in his own faeces and body fluids with blood over the floor. Um, again, um, Dr Hay, Professor Hay, told the inquiry in his oral evidence and written evidence a little about the arrangements for treating HIV and HCV positive patients in his time as director um, at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. Uh, so in that period from 1987 through to the early 1990s, um, and I, we've, we've summarised it, but as the inquiry has, has heard that evidence orally, I'm, I'm not proposing to go through um, it again. Um, so that, sir, is, is the Royal Liverpool Hospital and the Liverpool Haemophilia Centre for Adults. Um, I'm going to turn now to uh, Alderhay, the Children's Hospital. You, you were going to go to, to Walton, were you? Alderhay. Oh, I, I'll, do, I'll deal with Walton um, very briefly after I've dealt with Alderhay. Um, because there's, there's very, comparatively little information. I'm just going to move files around. So the Alder Hay Children's Hospital was the principal Liverpool site for the treatment of children with bleeding disorders, at least from the uh, late 1970s onwards, um, um, uh, uh, probably earlier. Um, from the mid-1970s until 1989, the centre director was Dr John Martin, uh, and we um, uh, uh, have a letter, I won't um, display it, but August 1975, Dr Martin writes that he's now taken over the care of haemophiliacs at this hospital. Dr. Martin, um, however, appears to have been essentially a paediatrician or paediatric oncologist rather than a haematologist, and, and he's generally described or referred to as such uh, in, in communications. Um, we do have a recent statement in response to various criticisms, which um, I'll, I'll describe over the next uh, period of time, of Alderhay. We have a statement from the current Director of Corporate Affairs at Alderhay who has said that Dr. Martin established one of the early childhood cancer centres at Alderhay but was not a specifically trained paediatric hematologist. Um, um, Dr. Martin um, ceased holding that position in 1989. Dr. Lynn Ball took over as the centre's director uh, for about four years, 1989 to 1993, and I'm going to refer to uh, her statement at various stages. Um, and then Dr. Paula Bolton Maggs, um, who previously I think spent a period of time, a relatively short period of time, as a in, in a more junior capacity there, took over as director from 1993 to 2003, and she has also provided a statement to the inquiry. Um, the um, evidence suggests that uh, uh, children, certainly younger children, those. Um, um, Un under the age of being a, a mid-teen were the responsibility of Alderhay rather than the uh, centre at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. Um, that reflects both the evidence of Dr. Bolton and the evidence of Dr. McVerry. 
um, and it's consistent with the evidence that we've seen, um, which suggests that, that treatment decisions were the responsibility of Dr. Martin. In, in terms of the mechanics for um, uh, supplying products, Dr. Ball's understanding is that products were ordered and supplied via the Adult Haemophilia Centre. So it received concentrate, her understanding uh, is by the uh, um, telephoning the on-call haematologist at the Royal Liverpool Hospital, who would then organise um, the provision of the, the, the concentrates or, or other products to Alderhe. Um, there's an article, again, I'm not proposing to put it on screen, but there's an article from 1990 in the Haemophilia Society Bulletin from Professor Hay, uh, in which he says that haemophilia care in Liverpool was traditionally divided between Alder Hay and the Royal Liverpool, with patients graduating from the one to the other in their mid-teens. Uh, I referred yesterday when we started looking at the uh, Liverpool Centre uh, to the relationship with North Wales, and that was also the position in relation to children and Alder Hay. Um, so Dr David Edwards, again, who I referred to yesterday, consultant haematologist at Glan Clwyd Hospital from 1982 to 2006, has explained in his statement to the inquiry that paediatric cases were essentially managed by paediatricians with outreach consultants from Alder Hay Hospital in Liverpool. Um, there is some evidence of cryoprecipitate being provided directly from the Regional Transfusion Centre, the Mersey Regional Transfusion Centre, to Alder Hay. Um, and, and then there is some evidence to suggest that just as with the uh, Liverpool Centre at the Royal Liverpool Hospital, the Children's Centre, the Alderhay Centre, um, formed part of two regional groups, the Manchester Supra region, and then a regional group of Mersey and North Wales haematologists. But it doesn't appear that Dr Martin played a significant part or, 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 or participated significantly in either of those groups. So we don't see, for example, in some of the, the meetings at the Manchester Super Region, we don't see a reflection of Dr. Martin attending, um, although it's right to say we don't have a full set of, 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 of minutes in that regard. Um, we, we, um, we do see Dr. Martin attending one meeting of the regional group of Mersey and North Wales haematologists in November 1983. Um, Dr. Bolton Mags's recollection as a senior registrar between 87 and 88 at Alder Hay was that there was no consultant haematologist, um, hence the care was um, undertaken by Dr Martin, and no specific facilities for patients with bleeding disorders. She says patients would have been seen for acute bleeding problems on the oncology ward and followed in general haematology outpatients. Uh, and she says... Um, uh, her understanding was that haemophilia uh, uh, child patients would have been under the care of Dr John Martin, consultant oncologist, and additionally managed by rotating senior registrars in haematology with advice as required from haematology consultants at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. Um, when Dr Ball took up her post as director in January 1989, she set out in her statement... Um, um, her, her critical observations um, of, of the, um, the position. Um, and if we just look at her, part of her statement, WITN 4739001, and we go to page 13. She says, I started mid-January, that's 1989, as Dr. Martin took vacation commencing the first day of my tenure. I was not provided with any overview or patient summaries, but was nonetheless required to take on all acute clinical inpatient and outpatient care for the whole unit, as well as all diagnostic responsibility for the haematology laboratory, including the on-call commitment single-handed until his return to duties. In stark contrast to my experience at Great Ormond Street, where Dr. Ball had previously worked, the provision of clinical and laboratory services offered to children with haemophilia, especially those with HIV at the time of my appointment, was severely compromised. There had been no investment in laboratory facilities or equipment for a decade. 
the automated cell counter was out of date and on loan from Coulter, and there was no on-site facility for monitoring anything other than basic coagulation screening. Preoperative and therapeutic monitoring of factor eight or nine levels had to be transported to the Royal Liverpool Hospital at a 30 minute transport time for analysis and any suspected inhibitors similarly analyzed off site. Laboratory staff had no protective area to prepare contaminated samples prior to analysis and there were no facilities to monitor immunological parameters for affected children. Um, and then if we go over the page, I'm, I'm going to come back to what she says about the position of the HIV infected children at a later stage. Third paragraph, there was no established treatment centre, no specialist nurse or social worker provision, no outpatient clinics, no immunological monitoring or screening, and the majority of children had not received routine vaccination against hepatitis B, and there was a paucity of successful home treatment and self-administration programmes. Uh, this meant that for acute minor bleeds, boys accessed the haematology oncology ward, C3, and were treated with concentrate ordered and supplied ad hoc from the Royal Liverpool Hospital. As there was no batch reservation to reduce donor exposure, it was difficult to determine what the individual usage per child had been prior to my appointment. A large proportion of the clinical notes of children affected by HIV were, on close inspection, missing essential treatment and decision-making details. As far as I could ascertain, there were no protocols for the use of alternatives such as cryoprecipitate or DDABP. And then um, the next page... Sorry... Um, just say she, she wrote an extensive case for the need for a second consultant, um, which she submitted to the newly appointed medical director of the hospital, who was, in fact, Dr. John Martin. Um, and then she describes, on the advice of Dr. Hay, who'd taken over at the adult centre more recently, um, she was able to access a regional fund um, to provide um, some additional funding for the provision of care um, at the children's hospital. Um, and, and to make out a case for a nurse social worker um, uh, um, and to develop the services and, and build up clinics. So the, the description she gives um, it, it amounts to there being no uh, expert doctor, no expert nurse, so there's nobody, nobody in the clinical staff who actually has any developed expertise in what they're doing. Yes. Um, Alder Hay were invited to um, respond to Dr. Ball's statement, um, and it's right to know that they, that note that they had done so. I referred, I think, earlier to um, Erica Saunders, Director of Corporate Affairs at Alder Hay Children's Hospital, um, uh, uh, having responded. Um, and if, uh, uh, perhaps if we look at WITN 419406, Um, if we go to the third page, she says this at paragraph nine. Dr. John Martin had established one of the early childhood cancer centres at Alderhey. Due to the lack of specifically trained paediatric haematologists, much of the care of children with non-malignant haematological conditions defaulted to clinicians running the malignant service and was provided on the oncology ward. Very sadly, the information I have received is that this led to children with bleeding disorders being exposed to inappropriate treatment and delays in adopting improvements to their management. She then says the appointment of, and, and she's referring there to Dr. Ball, um, was in recognition of the developing speciality of paediatric haematology, but there was a lack of additional support for the non-malignant clinical elements in the laboratory service. The separation of clinical care of patients with inherited bleeding disorders from the oncology service was partly precipitated by the need to care for a cohort of boys infected with HIV. And I'll come back to that issue. That's about how the children infected with HIV were actually treated at, at, at Alder Hay, about which Dr. Ball has um, um, uh, um, a lot to say um, and to which Ms. Saunders um, has responded. Um, and uh, So I'll come back to that and I'll come back to um, Ms. Saunders' response and indeed the apology that she offers when we get to that stage of the in relation to Alder Hay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick matters up next with the annual returns for Alder Hay from 1977 onwards, so it, it might be a good moment to take a break. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, 
what time do you wish to? Um, <laughs> sorry, yes, of course. Um, no, I, I was just uh, just thinking about this uh, this last piece of evidence. Um, uh, it, it's tw twenty-five to. Certainly. Twenty-five to twelve. 